I was the first one to be picked up, so they put me in a cell. They locked me in there in this degrading little outfit. Hey, I don't want anybody laughing. Violating the rules of our fucking simulation! Well, I gotta go to a doctor, anything. Jesus Christ, I'm burning up inside, don't you know? Screamed so loud in my life. Never been so upset in my life. It was an experience of being out of control. I just fucking can't take it. Stanford University, Northern California, one of America's most prestigious academic institutions, and in 1971, the scene of one of the most notorious experiments in the history of psychology. I was interested in what happens if you put good people in an evil place. Does the situation outside of you, the institution, c come to control your behavior? Or does the things inside of you, your attitude, your values, your morality, uh, allow you to, to rise above uh, a negative environment? The negative environment Zimbardo chose to test his ideas was a prison. He would convert the basement of the university's psychology department into a subterranean jail. We put uh, prison doors on each of three office cells. In the cells, there was nothing but three beds, uh, and, and there was very, actually very little room for anything else because they were very small. And here we had solitary confinement, which we call the hole. Uh, and in the hole was, was the place where prisoners would be put for punishment. It was a very, very small area. When you closed the door, it was totally dark. All the guards wore military uniforms and we had them wear these silver reflecting sunglasses and what it does is you can't see someone's eyes and so that loses some of the, the humanness the humanity in general we wanted to create a sense of power that is the guards as a category are people who have power over others in this case power over the prisoners a decade earlier psychologist Stanley Milgram had also looked at how we respond to authority in order to understand how people were induced to obey unjust regimes and participate in atrocities such as the Holocaust, he set up an experiment. Volunteers were told they were taking part in scientific research to improve memory. Will you open those and tell me which of you is which, please? Teacher. 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 Separated by a screen, the teacher would ask the learner questions in a word game and administer an electric shock when the answer was incorrect. He was told to increase the voltage with each wrong answer. Cloud, horse, rock, house. Answer, wrong. 150 volts. Answer, horse. Oh. Experiment, that's all. Get me out of here. Get me out of here, please. Continue, please. Go right on. Right. I refuse to go on. Let me out. You refuse to go on. The experiment requires you continue, teacher. Please continue. Participants didn't know that the learner was really an actor, and the so-called shocks harmless. You're going to get a shock. 180 volts. Oh. I can't stand the pain. Let me out of here. You can't here. stand it. I'm not going to kill that man, eh? I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. All right, next one. Slow. Walk, dance, truck, music. Two-thirds of volunteers were prepared to administer a potentially fatal electric shock when encouraged to do so by what they perceived as a legitimate authority figure. In this case, a man in a white coat. 375 volts. I think something's happened to that fellow in there. I don't get no answer. He was hollering with less voltage. Can't you check in and see if he's all right, please? Milgram's findings horrified America. They showed that decent American citizens were as capable of committing acts against their conscience as the Germans had been under the Nazis. Like Milgram, Zimbardo was interested in the power of social situations to overwhelm individuals. 
His experiment would test people's responses to an oppressive regime. Would they accept it or act against it? Zimbardo's experiment was conducted against a backdrop of civil rights activism and protest against the Vietnam War. There was a sense of student power, student dominance, and student rebellion against, against authority in general. It was from the student body that Zimbardo selected his participants. After passing tests to screen out anyone with a psychological abnormality, they were paid $15 a day. Each was randomly assigned to the role of guard or prisoner. It was a prison to me. It still is a prison to me. I don't look on it as an experiment or a simulation. It was just a, a, a prison that was run by psychologists instead of run by the state. I was 20, and that September I was going to college, and it would be nice to have a summer job, but there sure wasn't a lot of time left. And I looked in the WAN ads, and I found this thing which was just going to fit. It was just two weeks. Once you put a uniform on and are given a job to keep these people in line, you really become that person. Once you put on that khaki uniform, you put on the glasses, you put on, you take the nightstick. I was on summer break from my first year in college and uh, I was looking for a job. Had to choose between that and making pizzas. That sounded like a lot more fun. As well as running the experiment, Zimbardo took on the role of prison superintendent. He began by briefing the guards. I said, you have to maintain law and order. If prisoners escape, the study is over, and you can't use physical violence. You can create a sense of fear in them. You can create a notion that their life is totally controlled by us, and that there'll be constant surveillance. We have total power in the situation, and they have none. Prisoners were brought to the basement prison, blindfolded, to confuse them about their whereabouts. They were stripped and deloused. Of course, the guards started making fun of their genitals and humiliating them. And really, it's the start of what's known as the degradation process, which not only prisons, but lots of military-type outfits use that process. When I first got here, even though like, I had to strip and they would call me names, I still didn't feel at all like I was in the prison. I was just looking at it as a job. I recall sort of walking up and down the uh, very short hallway, which was the prison hall, and looking in on the prisoners, and they're basically lounging around on their beds. I felt it was like the day in summer camp. The first day, I said, this might be a very long, very boring experiment, uh, because it's conceivable nothing will happen. I arrived independently at the conclusion that this experiment must have been put together to prove a point about prisons being a cruel and inhumane place. And therefore, I would do my part you know, to, to help those results come about. I was a confrontational and arrogant 18-year-old uh, at the time. And uh, you know, I said, somebody ought to stir things up a bit here. On the second morning, the prisoners had decided to stir things up as well. The guards found some of them had used their beds to barricade their cell. Prisoner 8612 was one of the ringleaders of the rebellion. Initially, I was stunned. I didn't expect a rebellion because not much happened. I mean, it wasn't clear what they were what they were rebelling against, but they were rebelling against the status, rebelling against being anonymous, against um, having to follow orders from, from these, these other students. As punishment for the rebellion, prisoner 8612 was put in the hole, and the guards turned on the other prisoners. The guards felt that they now have to up the ante of being tough. The prisoners made the mistake of beginning to use profanity against the guards in a very personalized way. So not against the guards, but, you know, you little punk, you, you big shit, and so forth. And the guards got furious. Everybody out. Oh, come on. Oh, oh. Well, gentlemen, here it is, time for count. Prisoners were repeatedly woken in the middle of the night. The guards made them do menial, physical tasks and clean out toilets with their bare hands. 
we made it a, a point to not give them any sense of, of comfort or what to expect that it, you know that anything could happen to them at any time including being rousted from their sleep at any hour and forced to stand up in a line and have me hurl insults at them and uh, make them do exercises when you interrupt people's sleep they tend to become a little disoriented and since there was no daylight in the prison they had no idea whether it was night or day I think that I was the instigator of this uh, whole schedule of harassment. The harassment of the guards took its toll on rebellion leader 8612. He told Zimbardo he wanted to leave the experiment. Zimbardo responded not as a psychologist, but as a prison superintendent. I said, well, I can see to it the guards don't hassle you personally. Uh, and in return, all I would like is some information of, from time to time about what the prisoners are doing. So essentially I'm saying, I'd like you to be a snitch, an informer. And I said, think it over, and if you still want to leave, fine. Confused, prisoner 8612 returned to his cell and told the other prisoners that no one could leave. He believed that we wouldn't let him go, although we've never said that. But the fact that he was the ringleader of the rebellion and he told the other prisoners, they won't let you leave. And that really transformed the experiment into a prison. I was told that I couldn't quit. And at that point, I just felt totally hopeless. More hopeless than I'd ever felt before. Soon after returning to his cell, prisoner 8612 started showing signs of severe distress. God damn it! You're fucked up! You don't know, you don't know! I mean, God! I mean, Jesus Christ, I'm burning up inside, don't you know? I just fucking can't take it. He came up with a plan that if he acted crazy, we would have to release him. You're so fucked up inside, I feel really fucked up inside. You don't know, I gotta go. I to a doctor, anything. I can't say that. I'm fucked up. I don't know how to explain it. I'm all fucked up inside. Help it out! Help it out now! It starts with make believe, and then he's doing it and cursing and screaming and you know whatever that little boundary is that he 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 moved across. Not that he became really crazy, but uh, he became you know excessively disturbed. I mean, so much so that we immediately said we have to release him. As an experience, it, it was unique. I've never scream so loud in my life. Um, I've never been so upset in my life. And it was an experience of being out of control. The boundary between reality and make-believe was to become blurred even for Zimbardo. A rumor circulated that released prisoner 8612 would return with friends to liberate the remaining prisoners. I quickly convinced myself that, you know, my most important function was, you know, not to allow this prison liberation to occur. And what could I do to keep my prison going, not the experiment going? The prison was dismantled and the prisoners moved to another part of the building. Zimbardo waited in the empty corridor, preparing to tell 8612 and his friends that the study was over when a colleague appeared and began asking questions about the scientific basis of the research. I'm trying to get rid of him. Then he says, what's the independent variable? I get furious because he doesn't understand <laughs> that there's a riot about to take place, that this prison is about to erupt. I had totally lost this whole other identity of scientists, researchers, psychologists. The rumored jailbreak never materialized. The guards had dismantled the prison for nothing and had to rebuild it. They took their frustration out on the prisoners. They escalated again the level of control, the level of dominance, the level of humiliating behavior. Eight one nine was the next prisoner to rebel against the harassment of the guards. He barricaded himself in his cell and refused to take part in the count. You're not only not getting a cigarette, but for as long as the cell's blockaded, you're going to be in solitary when you get out. Like a For 819's disobedience, the guards made his cellmates do mindless work. This undermined any vestige of solidarity amongst the prisoners, who now chose to accept the tyranny of the guards rather than risk further harassment. That was one of the surprising things to me, is that 
there was so little uh, that the prisoners did to support one another after we started our campaign of, you know, divide and conquer. Isolated and distraught, prisoner 819 told Zimbardo he wanted to leave. While I'm interviewing 819 uh, and saying, okay, you know, it's all over, thank you for your participation, you know, I'll give you money for the whole, for the whole two 